Well, three matches of the 2023-2024 African Champions League were played on Saturday night. Uh, three quarterfinals, and in each of the quarterfinals, it finished nil-nil. Um, 270 minutes played, zero goals to show for. Zero goals conceded as well. Let's talk about it. My name is Maher Mizahi. I'm your host of the African 5 Aside podcast. This podcast, as all on this channel have been, are brought to you by www.africasacountry.com. And so on Saturday, I was really, really looking forward to uh, watching these matches. Um, first of all, we had Mazembe versus Petro de Luanda in the morning. In the afternoon, we had Yanga versus Mamelodi Sundowns. And in the evening, we had Esperance de Tunis uh, versus Azek Mimosa. All matches that we sort of thought would be tight. And we've said so many times now on this podcast that this version of the CAF Champions League has been rewarding staunch defending. And that teams took that to heart and they were looking to implement it. And nowhere was that more on display. No more colorful illustration or demonstration could we have hoped for than what we saw on Saturday. And it starts with the early morning, or I should say early afternoon match between Tipi Mazembe and Petro de Luanda. Let's, let's, some of the pre-match notes that I took. Petro haven't conceded throughout this CAF Champions League. Um, I believe they've played seven matches now when you factor in uh, the group stages. Haven't conceded a single goal. Petro de Luanda haven't lost a match in any competition since October 2023. So they're on an unbeaten streak that's going on for five to six months. However, despite all of that, so, so we know how difficult it is to, uh, to, to break them down. Mazembe are one of those cities, you know, it's one of those places on the African continent that is a football city, a bona fide football city. You know, there are there are these cities that aren't necessarily capitals, but are probably the home of football in their respective countries. Ghanaian fans know what I'm talking about, you know, in Kumasi. Um, for Nigerians, maybe that's a place like Keno, um, up in the north where people just die for football. Um even Garoua in, in, in Cameroon, in Algeria, it's in the east part of Algeria, Anaba. These are cities that if you don't follow football, maybe you never heard of. Um, but their clubs, for some reason, have a huge amount of support and they have a lot of historic success. And Lubumbashi is definitely one of those places. And I'd like to like maybe write about this, you know, or like do a series on this, on these, these football cities across the African continent, because... That, that stadium uh, in Lubumbashi for Tipe Mazembe with no running track and the, the, the fans are so close to the players and it's intimate and it's loud and it's pulsating. Despite Petro de Luanda's defensive um, prowess this season, I thought that that kind of atmosphere could get to them. And early on, it seemed like it did get to them. There's a very, very big chance uh, 10 minutes in and it falls to Oscar Kabwit. And this is a player that I personally discovered um, during this match because he had only played, I think he'd come on as a substitute in two matches in the group stages. He had never started before for Mazembe. He's only 18 years old and he starts this match on the right wing instead of Sheikh Fofana from Mali, who uh, we talked about as maybe one of the up-and-comers to keep an eye on uh, in the knockout stages of the CAF Champions League. So Oscar Kabwe, a Congolese winger, latches onto a crossfield ball and I... I thought this was a wonderful finish. He hits it near post and high, kind of like Bukayo Saka t- tends to do with Arsenal. But Marquez, the Angolan, experienced Angolan goalkeeper, 38 years old, makes a beautiful last-minute save. And, and Kebwit, I thought, was really dangerous in the early stages of the first half. Um, I think he had another where he makes a beautiful diagonal run uh, from the right wing coming into the middle and then take, taking on you know one of the center halves. And it's a, a great pass. I, I don't know who played the pass. And he tries to lob the goalkeeper, but it just goes over the goal as well. And so I thought Mazembe really threatened Petro de Luanda early on, especially, especially uh, vertically with long diagonal passes to their pacey strikers, uh, Fili Traore. Um, sometimes it was like even Claudie Leconza um, from midfield. Um, Joel Beya, who, who is from Lubumbashi. So this match meant a lot to him. Um, and, and Oscar Kebwit as well. So... I thought Mazembe started well, but they were just a little bit wasteful, kind of like Simba were against Al Ahli, right? Um, and I thought as the match went on, you could see the experience of Petro 
Petro, who have so many players that you know are over the age of 26, 27, with a lot of experience. And um, they started to keep their shape. They started to keep those those runs behind the defense in front of them. Um, at times they were defending, and you could see that all 30 players were within their own 30 meters of the pitch. Sorry, all 11 players were on their own 30 meters of the pitch. So they weren't uh, leaving any spaces in between the lines. They were very compact. However, Petro, I noticed, aren't really a side that were threatening either with the, on the counterattack. And that's, I think, something that something that we should keep an eye on um you know if they make it out to the semifinals or the, or the final it's when they're defending they're defending very well but if they don't have lines share of possession they're not really attacking um so when they're defending they're defending well but they can't really counter attack or hurt you in transition from what i saw in this match against mazembe um overall i think petro are going to be the happier side with the result, I think they came here to get a draw. But in this edition of the CAF Champions League, away goals still count. So um, this is going to be a tricky tie this weekend because Mazembe, with their dangerous attackers, you know, all they need uh, is a single goal. And if they can get that one goal, um, you know, then Petro are going to have to get two. So uh, that's going to be an interesting tie. That's the second match of the day was between Yanga and Mamalori Sundowns. For me, this was the most interesting or intriguing match uh, of the quarterfinals or it, it remains the most intriguing tie for me because <clears throat> I love what Yanga has been doing over the last two three years and I think Sundowns are the best team in Africa and so um, I, I really took the um, I took the time to listen to the pre-match press conference from Gulani Makwena the Sundowns coach and I recommend if you haven't heard it I recommend you do it I just love that there's a coach out there that's, you know, forensically breaking down his opponents in pre-match press conferences, talking about uh, what kind of formations they use, how they defended in this match versus that match, which players he thinks are going to be dangerous, uh, and so on and so forth. And so that was a, a real treat to listen to. Um, and the other treat that came out of that press conference was uh, Miguel Gamondi, the Argentine, as one of the, the viewers uh, correctly pointed out, not the Spanish coach, the Argentine coach. Um, I didn't know that they co they coached at the same club uh, a few years back at Platinum Stars when Gamondi was a senior uh, coach and Rulani was coaching the, the youth. Um, so those were really cool moments. And I recommend, you know, check out these pre-match press conferences. You can learn a bit uh, if interested. Anyways, um, Yanga are playing at home, but they're playing without many of their best players. Players like Pakom Zuzwa, Kali Raucho, and the right back Yao. And for me... I was very wary about how Yanga were going to defend. Remember, it, it, as we were previewing the quarterfinals, we talked a lot about how this tournament is rewarding teams that defend well. And of all the teams in the group stages, I thought Yanga defended the worst, especially away from home. Now, in this match, they were playing at home. And Rulani predicted that they would play with five at the back, you know, three center halves, as they did when they were playing against Al Ahli at home as well, um, when they drew 1-1. And that's exactly what they did. And I think it was a good decision, especially with some of your best players out. Uh, those three that I mentioned are key players, Zuzwa and Aucho and Yao. Um, and, and Yanga basically told Sundowns, you know what, you guys can keep the ball. Um, that doesn't mean that they conceded the match to them. Because if you look at the amount of shots, Yanga had seven, Sundowns had ten. Um, but the amount of possession, Sundowns had 70% possession. Yanga only had 30. However, Sundowns didn't have one big chance. If we go back to that statistic, you know, um, that's not to say they didn't have chances, but it, they weren't like clear cut. We expect them to score 100% uh, chances. Um, and I think Yanga's going to have to do this again away from home in Pretoria. Um, I think the only way you can beat Sundowns if you're a club like Yanga or you're any other club on the continent, really, that's not Al Ahli is that you can't try to outpossess them. You can't try to dominate them territorially. You need to defend compactly. And when you get those half opportunities, uh, you need to capitalize on them. Um, I, because they're just too good tac technically, tactically, um, in so many different ways they can hurt you. So I think you need to know which battles you want to fight. You, know? um, you can concede possession, defend well. When you have a set piece, make sure it's taken very well. 
when you have a counterattacking opportunity, make sure you go in numbers. I think that's how Yanga uh, are going to have a chance. And even then, you only have a slight chance to beat Sundowns. So Sundowns remain my favorites for the entire competition. But again, nil-nil. As with the first match, going into the, the return leg in Pretoria, it's going to be tricky, as for all of these matches. Finally, the last match of the evening was uh, Esperance versus Asik Mimosa. And um, maybe for those of you that are not based in the north uh, of the continent, um, you know, it's, it's a really late kickoff, 10 p.m. <laughs> One of my South African friends texted me, said, you North Africans, you never sleep. But that's a Ramadan kickoff. Um, and Ramadan matches, for those of you that have never been, uh, never experienced it, they're different. They're very nostalgic. It's like, you know when they say like midweek Champions League nights in Europe, and there's something about it, you know? It's similar in, in North Africa with those Ramadan matches. Um, so there's a late kickoff, you know, and, and you've spent the whole day hungry and thirsty. All of a sudden you've eaten, the endorphins are kicking in. Uh, a lot of the times people go to the mosque to pray and they come out with that spiritual boost as well. Uh, the night feels young because you took a nap, you know. Uh, even though it's 10 p.m., you feel like, you know what, this is going to be a long night and we're going to enjoy it. And then even like the stadium experience, you know, like instead of buying a sandwich or a wrap like you usually would, uh, now you're enjoying, you know, like desserts or coffee at the stadium. These are the things that they're serving. Even at the stadium, the, the foodstuffs are different. So um, there's a texture to a Ramadan match that you don't really feel, um, you know, in any other match in the calendar year. And so that's one thing I just wanted to touch on as Esperance are hosting ASIC. But anyways, I think this sim felt similar to the Simba match or the Mazembe match where uh, Esperance were creating half chances. Actually, Mazembe's chances were actually pretty dangerous, but Simba's weren't, right? And same thing with Esperance. They weren't really creating real chances uh, against ASIC. ASIC gave them the ball. Um, 80% possession of the ball. They only had 20% possession. And Esperance couldn't really break them down, though. They, they passed the ball more than 600 times during the game. They had 22 shots. But of the 22 shots, only three were on target. And they created zero big chances. Um, how many times they advanced the ball up the pitch? Essek let them advance the ball up the pitch. The fullbacks get on the ball in advanced positions, and then it's either a crappy cross or... Uh, or sometimes like the cross is decent, but the the header is like five or six come to mind. The header is just bloop over the over the opposition goal or wide. Um, so Esperance were. It's not that they were sloppy. I think Asik defended well. I think they they couldn't break them down in the final third of the pitch. Asik invited that pressure, and they said, "You know what? Come and break us down." And they couldn't. Um, so it was a lot slower of a match than the Mazembe match, especially at the beginning. Um, I think in, in terms of pace and rhythm, it resembled the Yanga versus uh, Sundowns, um, but it was a little more lopsided in that Esperance had so many chances. Um, and, well, not really, so many half chances. And ASIC weren't even interested really in counterattacking. Um... The only real, real chance came from a substitute named Osama Bouguera, who cut in from the left wing, and he, hit, he struck this ball so beautifully. You see when you strike the ball, and there are no revol revolutions on it, and it's just cutting through the air. It's not There's no backspin, there's no English, nothing. And it hits the, it hits the crossbar perfectly flush, and, and it's just from maybe 30 yards out, and it's just unlucky. Uh, uh, an effort like that deserved a goal. But besides that, and again, how are you going to, you can't defend against that perfectly, right? Um, Esperance couldn't break down ASEC in the final third of the match. So it's going to be very interesting to see if ASEC try to flip that and take the game to Esperance um, in Abidjan. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. And I just wanted to, you know, lay down my quick thoughts about uh, the quarterfinals of this. Um, 2023-2024 CAF Champions League and so uh, very very big matches this weekend ahead uh, again please do let me know which matches you're looking forward to watching and um, what you thought of this weekend's action uh, as boring as some of you thought it might have been all right thanks for listening take care peace <laughs>